some of you guys know, I uh, recently began to work again uh, in a job outside the church. I took a part-time job at Curry Box right down the street, so it's kind of been our favorite spot to go to lunch. And so I said, hey, and they, they saw hiring time, and why not I could get a part-time job right down the street? So uh, it's, it's been a really fun experience, and some of it is um, really uh, small tasks that I have to do on a regular basis. So I get in and I have a checklist. Anybody else have a checklist? Maybe when you used to work at McDonald's as a teenager or something like that, you got the checklist you got to go through when you're opening the store up or closing the store. So we got this checklist, and one, on the checklist, one of the things that we have to do every morning is uh, that sweet and sour sauce. Anybody get some egg rolls? You like the sweet and sour sauce? So yeah, so I have to put together the sweet and sour sauce and the plum sauce every morning. I come in, we get these little, little tiny Dixie cups, uh, little clear things, and then take a scoop, one ounce scoop, and I gotta scoop out one ounce, and I do about 30 of them, you know? And then I go through the plum sauce, and I gotta do all the plum sauce, you know? And uh, as, I'm, as I'm doing this, it, without fail, every time I do the, the, the sweet and sour and the plum sauce, there's this just sticky residue everywhere and around, right? It's on my fingers, it's like on the, on the bench, the, the prep table. So I gotta get the rag out, you know, clean it all up, clean up my fingers, get them all washed off. And as I'm, as I'm doing this little task over, over the last couple of weeks, it reminded me of a game I used to play as a, as a kid. We had this uh, a game, it was probably from the Christian bookstore, but it was called Sticky Situations. And uh, it was this, it was a game as a little kid trying to help to help teach us you know um, hey there's some, sometimes there's sticky situations you get yourself into or what are you going to decide to do when you're in a sticky situation and so I'm doing this pouring this sticky sauce in these cups again the other the, this week and I was just reminded oh yeah so one of, one of the sticky situations was what what if you go to your friend's house. And you know, and uh, you know that your parents would not allow you to watch the movie that they recommend to watch. What are you gonna do? You know, as a little kid, you're thinking like, "Oh, what do I do? That's a really hard. That's a really hard decision. Should I watch what they? What I know my parents should watch or not?" And they had they had a couple others. You know, hey, when your brother uh, t takes a toy that you want, you know, and, and you know that you're stronger than him, you can take it from him. What are you gonna do? You know, like really dilemma dilemma situations for for a little kid. But I know in our lives, right, we sometimes also find ourselves yes. what we would call sometimes sticky situations. Sometimes things that they may look appealing to the eye, they may uh, be something that we maybe even desire to do, but we know that if we did them or if we found ourselves in them, we would find ourselves in opposition to what God would desire for our lives, right? And we do have an enemy of our soul, and he loves to trap us in situations that would try to get us to betray God in our lives. And so in each one of our lives, we can know, we can know those situations. We're like, oh yeah, I can remember that moment I wanted to cheat on this situation. I, I know I remember that moment that I wanted to, to, to gossip about that situation. I know that moment that I wanted to act on the desires of my flesh more than the desires of my heart. I remember those moments. And sometimes, I remember as a little kid, or as a teenager, I used to talk with some of my friends and we would talk about being like Jesus, being formed into the image of God, right? And, said, and they would always say, it isn't fair that Jesus was, they, they, talking about Jesus and his sinless life that he lived. They said, well, Jesus was God, and so he was, he was God, and so he was able to be perfect. But I'm not God, so it's okay that I have to you know, get myself into some sticky situation and fall into some temptations. I said, well, you know, that doesn't sound very hopeful to me. Oh, but God had this un Jesus had this unfair advantage. He asked me to look like him, and he asked me to be in his image. But yet, but yet, he's fully, he's fully God, and I just, uh, so what's, what is, I'm fully man, and I can read some scriptures that make me feel really bad. Uh -huh. We've been talking a little bit um, in our missional communities, our communities that meet on Wednesday night, we're going through the story of God, and we've, we've gotten to the point of Jesus, Jesus being born of a virgin Mary, so he was not just fully God, he wasn't just the divine, but he was fully man. And so today we're going to talk, and, and I hope that today we're going to give you some hope Maybe you find yourself in a situation that you, you say, hey, this is the temptation that I uh, fall into, that I find myself in this over and over again. Or, or maybe you say, hey, I, I want to be free from this and I don't know how. I feel trapped in this current situation. But I want to proclaim today that there's hope. 
There is a way out. There is a way of escape. And so we're going to examine over the next two weeks ways of escape. How are we to escape these sticky situations? How are we to escape the things the enemy would try to cause us to believe, something that opposes God, would try to get us trapped in a situation that would betray uh, our relationship with God? So first uh, scripture we're going to read this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So I'd like you to turn with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Sometimes I find myself, what hope is there? Right? And there's sometimes maybe there's a question that rises in your mind. You know, am I going to be bound in this forever? Where is the end of the tunnel? Where is the freedom? Um, some of you guys that know my uh, testimony and what God has done in my life over the last five years and mine and Rachel's life know that I found myself in a, in a pit one time uh, and realizing the despair, having that I was actually in despair, that I had lost hope. And really in that moment, I found that I, didn't, I had to repent. We talk about that word a lot here at Catholic City Church, repent. I had to believe that there is actually a hope. It had to change what I was believing. I had fixed my eyes on something untrue, and it caused my life to be in despair. But there is hope this morning. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we're going to read about this hope. We're going to look at the story of Jesus, and we're going to see how is it that we can overcome these situations we find ourselves. How can we overcome this flesh that seems so desirous of things, contrary to who God is? There's hope this morning, and it's found in Jesus. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 13. And it says this, no temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Yes. No temptation has overcome you that is, that is uncommon to man. It's interesting if you read the book, uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 10 here, it's talking about the warnings of Israel. So Israel had had God with them. He had, they had the favor of God. They had the benefits of having um, God with them, guiding them at night and in the day. And, and the blessings that come when they were honoring Him, they saw the, the fruit of the blessings of the Lord in their lives over and over again. But yet, they turn to the idols that are around them. They begin to be jealous of the nations that were surrounding them. And they had other idols, and they were doing other things. And, and they took upon themselves these other things. And every time they did that, what happened? They removed, removed from them the blessing of God. But it says here, 13, No temptation has overtaken you, except what is common to man. So I love this because if I'm thinking about temptation, if I'm thinking about these sticky situations, I can study the enemy, and I know I can. We can know his tactics. There's hope in that. There's hope. I can. I can know what the enemy is going to do. I know that he only speaks one language. We talk about this a lot. He only speaks one. He only speaks lie. He only brings destruction. So I, I, there's there's something there's something common about the way that he tempts us. It's that situation that he tries to get us into. But yes, but this we know. God is faithful. Yes. So sometimes we begin to believe, because we know this, the, the nature of the enemy, that he, is, he does have strength. He does have some temptation that he, he goes, and he knows who we are. We're going to find that in, in the story, too. He knows who we are. We, he knows when we're, there's, there's weaknesses. He, he's aware of those things in our lives. But we got to remember, God is faithful. God is faithful. And, and as much as the enemy may try to think or may try to seem as though he is strong, we serve one that is stronger. We still serve one that is, that is victorious. We still serve one that is capable. The enemy is not invincible. Yes, amen. He's not. He's, he's not the one with victory. He's not the one with the trail of victory in his train, right? Mm -hmm. For that belongs to God and God alone. God is the one. He is faithful. And this is what he says about God. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And some people need to hear that this morning. Yes. He, will, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. And sometimes it seems that way. Sometimes the situation that we find ourselves in, the desires that we find in our hearts, are so much so that we, would, we think, hey, this is really hard, it would be much easier for me to do this. But the Lord says, it says here, he, we can bear it. We can actually overcome this. 
And, and it continues, but when you are tempted, he will also provide you a way out. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes I'm not looking, if I'm honest, sometimes I'm not looking for that way out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Find myself in a middle situation. This, this is contrary to what God wants. And sometimes I actually I find myself that I don't actually desire to find that way out. It's there. The word of God is true, right? It's there. And he says this because it's so that we can endure it. Now, this is an interesting thing. It, I love our fast nature of our culture, right? I kind of enjoy when I'm going to work, I, I, now I have a curry in the box, and hey, I know that we can make any meal fresh from scratch in seven minutes. It's kind of nice, right? We've we we kind of gotten used to this, okay, immediate relief of my hunger. There's no, you know, and typically in, in our society, there's, there's just no real true understanding of what it means to hunger. And maybe sometimes, some people in our gathering today or in our midst, maybe they have experienced that true feeling. But for the most part, we would say that we don't really know how to endure hunger. But it, it, this word here is that, that God gives us a way of escape. He gives it to us and He is there with us. He's faithful to us so that we can endure it. That actually the temptation, it doesn't promise us here that the temptation is going to leave. It doesn't uh, promise us here an immediacy of the change of our situations. It says He's faithful. He's going to make a way out so that you can endure yeah. the temptation that you find yourself in. So that you can go through it. You're going to get through it. This morning, the word of the Lord this morning is you can get through it. There's hope. Amen. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. I love the book of Hebrews because it talks about our Savior. It talks about this great priest that we have. It talks about Jesus in such a way that it makes me get excited, right? It makes me think, wow, Jesus, you are really that amazing. It goes through that we no longer have to uh, sacrifice animals for our sin, but there was a sacrifice in Jesus, the perfect sacrifice that was once and for all, and that gets me you know, excited. But then it continues, and it shows even the humanity of of Jesus in, in Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 18. I didn't, in this week, I found a new verse. Anybody anybody uh, find new verses sometimes? You're reading the word and you're like, I know I've read the book of Hebrews a uh, hundred times before. I know I've, I've studied temptations, different things. Well, this week I, I was studying and I found a new verse in the Bible. No, it's probably been, it's been there the whole time. <laughs> been there the whole time. But the way it was worded, I was like, I have Man, I, like, I would say it this way. Like, I didn't know this was in here like this. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, and I want to encourage you, we've been encouraging you guys to be in the Word, to read the Word, right? You're going to discover as you read the Word, there's a whole bunch of good stuff in here that just, it pops out at you, and it ministers to you, and it encourages you. And this is one of those words. I said, wow, I like that this is in the Word of God. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, says this. We talked about, right, we're going to be able to endure it, we have a Savior, Jesus, who knows the way out. And it just says in verse 18, because he himself, talking about Jesus, suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So we talked about this, right? Jesus is not, Jesus is perfect. He is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is on His heavenly throne, and He does have all the glory and the honor that we talk about. And He does have this holiness and perfection that He talks about. But He also is, He has been tempted. The verse, the verse here says, He has been tempted, and He is able to help those who are being tempted. Because He knows what it's like. And it encourages me. I'm not alone. And Jesus isn't this... Jesus and God, they aren't just, just distant creatures above waiting for us to all die and come and bow before Him and worship Him 24-7 for all eternity. No, He's a God that knows exactly who we are and how we are and knows what it means to be weak. He knows what it means to go through trials. He knows what it means to face situations that may tempt Him to go a different way. He knows these things, and that's why He's able to help us. That's why this morning we do not have to despair. Despair is overwhelming uh, as feeling that you have no hope. A loss of all hope. No, this morning we can say, no, we are a people that are full of hope. We are people that are victorious because we know we have a Savior this morning that identifies with us and He desires to help us. He desires to help us through. In those moments, in those situations that come, and you're wondering, what, what way should I go? Which path should I go? This seems so desirous for me, but I know that it's going to be contrary to what God desires for me. He knows those moments. He's experienced them too. We're going to examine that here in a moment. And He says He wants to help us. 
He wants to help us. He's not leaving us alone. He wants to help us. Let's look this morning. Uh, we're going to turn to our main passage this, main, uh, this morning in Matthew chapter 4. The temptation of Jesus. I think as we look at the story of Jesus this morning, we want to find some things, some elements in here, and learn, like I said, we can, we can learn the enemy's tactics, how he tries to trip us up. And we also can learn, I think, a great way of defense, a great way that Jesus also took up a defense against uh, the enemy. He, he found himself in situations just like we would find ourselves in situations even weak, tempted, seeing things in his own eyes and, and even desiring them, but yet defeated the enemy and even told him to flee. Next week we're going to talk for even more tactics, but this morning let's look to Jesus and say, Jesus, what do you have to teach us about fighting temptation? What do you have to teach us about getting out of these situations that we find ourselves in, sometimes even appeasing to our flesh and our own desires? So let's read here, Matthew chapter 4, starting uh, in verse 1. It says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I would be hungry. 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. But Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, in verse 8, it says, The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. I think there's some great insights that we can receive this morning at this battle. We know, if you um, are reading in the Gospels, we know this part of the story comes shortly after Jesus' baptism. So Jesus goes to John the Baptist, and he and John is like totally overwhelmed. Wow, Jesus, that you would come to me. Like, I'm not even worthy to baptize you. I can't even untie your shoes. But I'll do this. And Jesus is like, no, I must do this for obedience. Right? Jesus came back up. And there's an amazing moment right after that where the, the voice from heaven, the Father's voice, speaks. And, and audible enough that people in the, the Gospels, they record it. So people must have heard this. And he would say, this is my son who I'm well pleased. An amazing identity statement that was given to him that day. Again, confirming not only that he was flesh, he was Jesus, the carpenter's son, but he was also the divine, the son of God. And right after that, the dove, the dove that descends upon him, the Holy Spirit, in this moment, he's full of the Spirit, and he begins to enter into this time of temptation right after. What's interesting is, in verse 4, verse 1, or chapter 4, verse 1, it says that he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Now sometimes it's hard to me imagine that I find myself in situations that I may have been led to by the Holy Spirit, but then find that while I'm in that situation, all of a sudden there's temptation and there's dis dis destruction, there's things around me that aren't going the way I thought they would go. If I'm led by the Spirit, usually I think, hey, everything's going to be peachy keen and good, right? We're, we're excited that, hey, I, I know the Lord has told me to do this and to go here, and once I get to that location, I do those things, and all of a sudden things around me start changing. I said, well, God, didn't you send me to go here? I can imagine Jesus getting in that situation. He just spends 40 days and 40 nights. He's led by the Spirit. He's away with God, and the enemy comes, and I would be in that situation. God, what are you, what are you doing? But he finds himself led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, going without food, he's hungry. So as, I, as I'm looking at this, he, he's out, he's away, he's isolated. Anybody else been in a situation? I'm, I, I, I'm away from myself, I feel like I've got nobody with me. I'm weak, I'm hungry, I'm desire, I have some desires that are growing, my flesh is hungry, I want something. This is a position Jesus finds himself in, a place of weakness. The enemy knows our weaknesses. 
And sometimes he goes at us in, in a moment of weakness, and he says, hey, there's some stones here. You want to turn this into bread? I mean, how many in the heart would I be like, yes, I'll, I'll, all that bread. Maybe a, maybe a filet mignon, maybe a salad for some of the vegetarians, some tofu dish, right? But I'm on it. I want that. I, it's an immediate, it's going to be an immediate pleasure to the needs that I have, that, I'm, that I have, right? And sometimes we find ourselves that in that sticky situation, in those moments of temptations. Why is it such a tempting thing? Because it appears that it's going to satisfy me. The enemy loves to twist things, right? To give good thing, an, an evil thing, an appearance of good. So when we're aware of this, when we're aware that hey, the enemy is going to find me in my weakness, hey, I'm going to be able to strengthen myself. I'm going to find myself in, in the middle. I'm going to strengthen myself because I know I'm, I'm weak. Hey, when I'm isolated, when I'm away from people, when I find myself lonely, and I, when I find some of these emotions rising within me, I want to become aware of this. Because the enemy knows these things too. Hey, when I'm lonely, then he's going to bring to me somebody false that's going to bring some attention to me that, that is meant to be brought to me by Jesus, by him alone. He's my comfort. He's my friend that speaks both than a brother. When I find myself alone, it's not true that actually God is with me. <coughs> it's interesting here that Jesus, he quotes uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. This is a, it, it, what's interesting about it to me is what I find that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, it's, it's the story of the Israelites. Israelites being in the desert. Uh, so they were delivered. So this was a great moment of victory. They're delivered from the captivity of Egypt, right? And they're, they're going through the desert and spending some, some years there. They're, they're there for not just a few days, they're there for some years. And they're learning the same thing that Jesus is having to walk through in this moment. That Jesus is, in this moment of weakness, though he is hungry, must depend on God for everything that he has. The Israelites were put in a situation where there was no good thing. They're in the desert. They can't cultivate farmland in the desert. They can't provide, uh, set up infrastructure and, and set up a city and care. I mean, they're in, the, they're in nothing. Isolation. And in that situation, the Israelites were, the opportunity that they had, and the same opportunity that we have in our weaknesses, is to depend on God's miraculous provision. And when they did so, in obedience to him, he came through, manna from heaven. Did you imagine waking up every morning and what you needed was just laying on your living room floor when you came out? You needed some finances, all of a sudden you just got to, you know, finances are right there. You, you needed to go to the grocery store, you can't get to the grocery store, and all of a sudden you walk out and there's a whole bunch of bags from cops or high or something. Just, I mean, that's what, that's what it was like. They had no need. Moses, you we can read about this story. Maybe we'll go through a series of, uh, about that next year. But Moses, right, he's, he's, he's going and, and they need water. You're out in the desert, I'm thirsty. God provides water out of the rock. <laughs> Miracles. Miracles. We can go through the Old Testament, all of them. There's a whole bunch of different men. Elijah and the, and the ghost of the widow and has the oil and the, and the flour and it doesn't run out, right? Miracles. Jesus responds to the enemy. He says to him, satisfy your hunger. Come on, I know you're hungry. He, turn it. Do it now. You depend on your own strength to satisfy mm -hmm. his diet. The temptation is that when we find ourselves, the enemy will come to us and will ask us to depend on ourselves rather than the miraculous power of God. And uh, he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. He says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Yes. It is to say to the enemy, I know that I could. I know I have the license. I know I have the power to turn these things into, into bread. But I want to trust on God's word. I want to trust on what he has said. I want to trust on what he's spoken to me. And in the midst of temptation, that's the, is the mode of operation that we should be in. I'm going to trust on the miraculous power of God. I'm going to trust on His strength. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in me. I want to lean on that power in this moment of temptation. And I'm going to have, I'm going to find my way out. Yeah. I'm going to find my way out. So then it's, it, it, it continues here. You know, I was, I was thinking, this, yeah, it, it continues here. Let's go to this next portion. The devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, 
for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up your lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike a stone and keep a foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It is also written, Don't put your glory of God to the test. Now, I don't know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how did Jesus how did the devil take Jesus to the holy temple? Like it doesn't record that. I, mean, I don't know if they traveled to there, but all of a sudden, like in a in a moment, they're like boom on the top of uh, on the top of the temple, you know, uh, transfigured or something there. Uh, I don't I don't know how that happened. And I was thinking about that, and I was trying to research, you know, what does the devil have his authority over Jesus? And he took, I don't know. And I thought, how familiar is it to us, also? That we find ourselves, and we find ourselves in the middle of a sticky situation. We find ourselves in the middle of temptation, and we and the the same question comes to our mind. I don't know how I got here. I didn't. And I didn't. I didn't mean. I didn't intend to get to this place. Or now I'm on this decision whether I'm going to follow Jesus or not to follow Jesus in this moment. And sometimes we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of our uh, of where we're going. We need to be aware of where our foot is leading us. We need to be aware of where our thoughts are leading us. You know, I know I, I counsel some college guys sometimes, and I'm like, okay, you know, after 30 minutes on YouTube, you get bored of YouTube, and then you head to the, down another road towards other entertainment on the internet. And I said, be aware of it. We need to be aware of who we are, and where our desires are, and where our weaknesses are, because sometimes we'll find ourselves the devil ends up taking us right to the point of temptation. And we say, I don't know how I got here. There's hope even in that moment, right? There's hope even in that moment that there's a way of escape. That the Lord is with us and He will enable us to endure it even in that moment when we find ourselves right on the edge of the line where I cross over, I know I'm going to be in sin. There's hope even in that very moment. Um. So the enemy here, he also loves to twist scriptures, so, right? So he makes something, he, he makes it. Turning the uh, stone into bread, he makes something evil look like it's good idea. He also he also loves to twist scripture. He did this with Adam and Eve. It was a kind of, kind of his original thing. Did God really say? Questioning it, right? So here is really peculiar. When you're just reading, when you're just reading the book of Matthew, or I want to maybe encourage you, in, when you're just reading the New Testament, sometimes there's quotes in here from the Old Testament scriptures. You know, the, the authors will use the, the Old Testament scripture because they're continuing to confirm that Jesus is who he said he was. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament, right? So, uh, he uses this scripture, and if you're reading it just Matthew chapter 4, you read it, and it looks really good. When you look at Psalms 91, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn there and read that for us this morning. Psalms 91 <laughs> is what he's quoting. Uh, Psalm 91, verse 11 through 12, and he, and he actually, he, he misquotes it. He takes something out of it. And what he takes out is really important here for the lesson that we're learning about how to overcome the, the enemy uh, when he brings situations into our life that tempt us to betray who God is. In Psalms 91, verse 11 through 12, it says this, For he will command his angels concerning you. Good line. Very true. Good job, enemy. Gold star in your memory verses. But you're missing something. To guard you in all of your ways, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they will lift up. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now, when I'm reading this again, I'm thinking about this. To guard you in all your ways, he, why would the enemy leave that out? Well, let's get back to this temptation. To guard you in all your ways, it's a line that the enemy missed out. So he tells Jesus in this moment. Take a risk. You jump off this temple, and you know God is good. He, he loves you. Sometimes, you. sometimes we hear this. You know, God is good. He loves you. He's going to take care of you. But in this moment, he's tempting Jesus to take advantage of who God is, his character, his goodness. That God is going to command his angels to guard us in all our ways. As we go about our day, He's with us. He's going to guard us on His. He's going to take us, right, uh, flank us from the left and from the right. He's going to be with us at all moments. He's always there, in all of our ways. But sometimes the enemy would cause us to try to take pride in what we have in in God. Test Him in this. Come on, see how good He really is. See, test this. 
You know, you know what you've got in God. It's, it's all right. Go for it. Taking advantage of this scripture. Taking advantage of the goodness that we find in God. And sometimes we find ourselves in the same way. Find ourselves in the midst of the sin and we know, hey, I can just do this a little bit longer. But once we find ourselves in, sometimes this comes to us, this lie, this way the enemy tries to tempt us, and we find ourselves in the middle of our sin, and he would convince us that we could go up with it a little bit longer. Look, it's, it's okay, just, just one more time, Andrew. You can, you can take advantage of this situation. Just one more time. It's all right. You know God is good. He's going to forgive you. Now, we don't, sometimes we don't want to admit that that's what we believe, but that's exactly what the enemy tries to get us to do. And Jesus comes back with it with such a word. It's such a strong word. Don't test God. I'm not going to test His goodness. I'm going to believe in faith that He is going to do what He says He's going to do. He's going to protect me in all my ways. As I walk through life, He's going to be there for me. But I'm not going to, I'm going to throw myself, I'm not going to take pride in myself and to rise myself up above what God has said, to take advantage of His goodness. We're basically, in that moment, we're using God for His goodness. God, I know you're faithful to forgive me of my sins if I can confess them to you. So I'm just going to go for it. Jesus answered him with scripture again. Do not put your Lord God to test. And that's what we have to remind ourselves in those moments when, hey, we find temptation so real, the desires of our flesh so strong within us, that we have to remind ourselves, yes, our God is good, and so let's celebrate that prior to the fact. Uh, a, a good teacher, we talk a lot about Jeff Vanderstill, but he, he talked about, he was talk, communicating with a young man in his ministry, and he was struggling with an addiction to pornography, and he, and he was asking himself, before you go into pornography, or, or after you have, uh, have dealt with your sin, after you have sinned, what feelings do you feel? And he said, well, I feel guilty, I feel shameful, I, 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 I hate myself, that I, that I again find myself in this mess, right? And, and, he, and Jeff says that he proposes to this man, what if prior to going into the moment of sin, prior to falling in sin, we take a moment of worship for what we have in God? So after we have sinned, we are, those who are believers, right? We're quick to say, Father, forgive me. God, I am, I, forgive me. He says, what if before we get into the temptation, we remember who God is, His goodness, that yes, there is forgiveness for me. And in the immediacy, you say, God, thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for this moment. He said, he asked the young man, what would you do? He said, oh, I would never sin. I would, I would never walk into that sin. I would never fulfill that desire that I have. Why? Because then our desire, our desire is switched. It becomes focused again on God's goodness. And we worship Him and we praise Him. Because, wow, God, Jesus, you died for this moment that I was about to get myself into. Trust in God to watch our steps. We don't take advantage of His goodness. But if we want to avoid the uh, sticky situation, we're going to avoid these the moments of temptation, if we're going to avoid moments of betrayal of who God is, man, we must trust in Him. We must have this moment of worship. We must create in ourselves a heart, a, a worshiping environment of who God is. Don't test His goodness. Let's look at this last um, section here in verse cha uh, chapter 4, verse 8. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. What's interesting in this temptation and a truth that I want you to remember this morning is that Satan tried to tempt Jesus with what he already had. Try to tempt Jesus with what he already had. Show him the kingdom of this world. We know that Jesus owns the cattle on the hill. He, he owned all of this. He's the king of the kings. He's Lord of Lord. He has everything belongs to him already. Yeah. But so many times the enemy will try to do the same thing to us. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you just do this, you'll get a little bit more fame. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you follow through with this, hey, the people will know who you are. It'll be good for you. We already have everything 
we need in Christ Jesus. There's nothing in this world, there's no temptation in this world that can, that can give us more than what we already have in Jesus. He is the one that satisfies our soul. He is the one that lifts our heart. He has made us, you know this? He's made us equal with Christ. Yes. We're co-heirs with Him. Yes. We have all things. I hope this is encouraging you this morning. We have it. We can face temptation. We have hope in the midst of temptation. We have a way out in the middle of temptation. We can endure temptation because there's nothing in this world the enemy can bring to us that, it's actually going to, uh, that can actually give us more than what, the enemy, what God has already given to us. The enemy tries to do this in, in Romans chapter 1. It talks about this, that, that the enemy tries to get us to worship created things rather than the Creator. He tries to get us to worship things that can try to grant us something that God has already given to us. Love, peace, joy, happiness, self-control, the says, inheritance is all given to us. A family is all given to us. Oftentimes the enemy will try to show us the glory of a sin rather than the cares of a sin. He tries to get us focused on the glory of the sin rather than the cares of the sin, rather than the effects of the sin, rather than the effects of what's going to happen to you. And you're going to enjoy this, he says to us, right? It's going to be good for you, he says to us. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, yeah, but then your family's going to leave you. It's going to cause strife with your, between you and your children. It's going to cause an issue in your workplace. It's going to destroy your life. It's going to give you no hope. You're going to find yourself in despair. He doesn't tell us all that. He just says, look at how great it's going to be. Jesus, look at how, look at you can have all these things. Just worship. You have all these things. Don't think about the care of, of the kingdom. He doesn't take care care about the, the people, the individual lives, the effects of the sin in our own lives and those who are around us. Jesus had to remember that He was the Son of God. We too, in our moments of temptation, in our moments of sin, we must too remember we are sons and daughters of, the, of God Most High, Hallelujah. favored from Him. This assurance that the Holy Spirit gives us, the Spirit, right, is the one that speaks to us and says that we are His children. Because the Spirit enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit is the one that reminds us that we are His children. This, this, the Spirit that speaks us to us, it is the assurance for our preparation for temptation. Knowing that I'm a child of God prepares me for temptation when temptation comes away. Because I don't want to do anything to lose what I have. And I know I have it really good. And this morning, I hope you also understand that we have it really good. Those of us that say Jesus is Lord, that God is our Father in Heaven, through Jesus Christ, His Son, man, we have it good. Amen. There's nothing in this world that can be better. And that assurance prepares us to endure temptation. Amen. What do you mean, enemy worship? What do you mean, enemy go that route? What do you mean, enemy take that shortcut? What do you mean? I, I, I know what I have already. It's not going to go any better for me. The Holy Spirit witnesses to us our sonship or our daughtership and will guard us. It will guard us with power. That Spirit is the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It will guard us with power to all the suggestion yes. of the evil one that He designed to bound us with. Yes. So we have freedom this morning. The freedom that we have freedom. I don't know what. I don't know everybody in the room, situations and things that are going on. And you say, man, I opened up, the, I opened up this the morning talking about, sometimes I find myself in a pit of despair, sometimes I find myself without any hope, sometimes I find myself asking myself, how, how am I going to escape? Is this ever going to end for me? The Spirit of God reminds us that we have freedom. And that reminder is designed to help us in a moment of temptation not to be bound by the temptation, yes. thing, oh, but to endure it. Right? The enemy is, is subtle, sometimes he's spiteful, he's daring in his temptations. <laughs> he comes to Jesus when, he, when he's hungry, and he tempts him with food. I said, perfect temptation. And some of us find ourselves in a situation where we're like, perfect temptation, and I mean, that was a good one. <laughs> nice try. 
But I want to remind you this morning, he's not invincible. He's he is a defeated foe. Yes. We do have victory over these things. We can find ourselves, you find yourself in the middle of, of temptation, you can find yourself in the middle of, of sin, and you say, I don't know how to find my way out. Salvation is stronger than what the enemy has bound you with. Hallelujah. The power of Jesus, the fact that he raised from the dead, it shows that we have victory over the things yes. that we find ourselves in. Yes. We don't have to wallow anymore. We don't have to, we don't have to be fearful anymore of, of, of finding ourselves again in sin. We can stand in the hope that we have in Jesus and endure those things. So what did Jesus do over and over again that we can also follow? Jesus rejected the enemy's proposal with truth. Yeah. So it's, it's we, we'll say this maybe every sermon, I don't know, every week. If you guys get tired of hearing me say it, I, I, I'll probably say it again. We've got to know the truth. Right. We need to know the Word of God. Right. We have to make it our motive every day. Man, I want to know His Word more because when we're able to know it, see, there's a there's a skill that the that the rabbis used to have when they were in the Jewish tradition when they were studying the the law before they were able to be taken under the the cloak of a, of a rabbi. They had to they had to study the law. They had to know the law. But it was even more so than knowing it. Right? It's one thing to quote it. I could quote you John three sixteen. Mm -hmm. God loved the world that He gave His only Son. Right? We, Maybe, there's probably half the, half the country could probably quote that, that scripture verse to you, right? But the, the second part of the, the training was to know, not only did you know the scripture, you could memorize it, you could yes. quote it back and forth, but did you know how to apply it in situations? Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, that's when the Holy Spirit comes in. So we've got we to gotta know it. Sometimes it will, take, it will take for us to memorize some things. Maybe we've got to memorize it. But it's not just memorizing it. It's to know it and knowing how to apply it. Because the enemy is going to come in and he's going to try to twist it. He's going to try to use it for his advantage. He, we, he did that to Jesus. He's going to do it to us, right? He, and he tries to twist it. And we must know, uh, know truth in such a way that we're going to be able to apply it to the temptation that he brings our way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you just take advantage of this financial situation, it's going to be better for you. No, enemy, I know that my, I am a co-heir with Christ and I have all the inheritance of heaven is mine. There's no cheating I have to do in this financial situation. It's not, it's not going to give me any more gain than what I already have in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you apply the word. You apply the truth to the situation. Man, this, this woman or this man is, is tempting me. This, there's, is, my flesh is desiring to be uh, with this individual. Why? Because I know it's going to bring some pleasure to me physically. I know it's going to be some pleasure to my emotions. It's going to cause my emotions to be as, as secure. My loneliness is going to meet those needs. But then I know this scripture. It says I have, a, I have one that sticks closer than a brother. I have one, his name is Jesus, he never forsakes me, he never leaves me alone. He's always with me. No enemy, you know what, I don't need this temptation, I don't need this man or this woman to meet those needs. I have one that has already met my needs. His name is Jesus. Amen. We memorize scripture, we learn our scriptures, and we learn the truth so that in situations of temptation we can apply the truth to them and defeat the enemy. In verse 10, Jesus says to him, he, he, he shows him everything. He says, bow down to me, worship me, and I'll give you all of this. And Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There is something that only the Lord, that there's, it's not something, everything that you desire, the Lord desires to meet. Yes. That's right, come on. Worship him and he will receive it from you. Yes. But he says, he starts off this thing about worshiping the Lord. He says this, away from me, Satan. There's an authority that we have in the name of Jesus. Like, oh, I'll say it. The enemy is defeated. Yes, yes. He's defeated. Yes. He's defeated. Hallelujah. We have a way out because he's defeated. Yeah, that's right. If Jesus would have never rose from the dead, Paul says, if he never rose from the dead, we're just hopeless. We're, we, have, we have no hope. We have no salvation. But Jesus conquered the enemy. Yes. And so if Jesus conquered the enemy, that same victory that he has is mine. And I can speak to the enemy and say, flee from me. He has to go. He has no hope. He has no way out of it. He has to go. The problem is sometimes we entertain him a little bit too long. We'll go into that next week. But we can speak to him. Flee from him. Go. 
temptation in Jesus' name. And it has to listen. It has to obey. He knows he's defeated. The way of escape this morning is truth. That's what I wanted to feel the Spirit lead me to this morning. The way of escape for our situation is truth. Let's turn again to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No temptation, uh, chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. So just put your call on that. God is faithful to bring victory, to bring you out, yeah. to clean you up, yeah. to restore what's been broken. And sometimes we need to hear that too. He can restore what is broken. When I found myself in the middle of, when I found myself in the middle of despair, the, the biggest thing that I needed to hear from God is that He could restore what I had gotten myself into. Yeah. And sometimes the enemy will try to convince us that that's not true, but it's true this morning. He's faithful yes. to bring salvation and to bring restoration to anything you're going through. He will not let us be tempted beyond what you can, but let me read this differently. He will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, He will provide a way out so that we can endure it. Let's pray this morning.